Orangutans are one of our closest relatives. Their name literally means people of the forest. They're one of the most intelligent animals on the planet, and looking into their expressive eyes, you can't help but feel a level of connection and kinship to these beautiful apes. Orangutans are easy to fall in love with, yet they're among the most endangered apes on the planet. How did this happen? Why is it still happening? And what are some small steps that we can take in order to ensure that it stops? We'll answer all these questions and more in today's episode of Conserving Hope. Orangutans are members of the family Hominidae, more commonly known as the Great Apes. I myself am also a member of the family Hominidae, as well as you and all of your friends and family. Unless you're watching this and you're not a human, in which case, what? The Great Apes are broken up into two subfamilies, Hominidae and Ponginae. Hominidae consists of two tribes and three genera, the genus Gorilla, the gorillas, the genus Pan, the chimpanzees and bonobos, and the genus Homo, which is where we human folk reside. The subgenus Ponginae, however, only includes one genus, Pongo, and three species, the Bornean orangutan, the Sumatran orangutan, and the Tapanuli orangutan. All three of these beautiful redheads are native to the islands of Borneo and Sumatra, where they spend nearly all of their time in the trees. They travel, eat, and even sleep among the branches, and with adult males standing at four and a half feet tall and weighing roughly 165 pounds, this makes them the largest arboreal mammals on the planet, as well as the only truly arboreal great apes. They're also the most independent great apes, best described as solitary but social. They don't go out of their way to interact with other orangutans, and they don't form permanent bonds with one another, but if they do happen to run into each other during their travels, their interactions can range from friendly to indifferent, and occasionally aggressive. Just depends on what kind of day they're having. This is only the case, however, for females and subadult males. Dominant males, on the other hand, claim territories which can be anywhere between 500 and 4,000 hectares in size, which they defend intensely against rival males. Dominant male orangutans are pretty easy to differentiate between females and subadult males due to those big cheek pads and hanging throat sac. Throat sac is my new favorite thing to call people that I don't like. Not only does the throat sac look super sexy, it also amplifies the dominant male's vocalizations. There are many distinctive noises made by orangutans used for communication, and these vocalizations can vary within different regions, which suggests cultural variations and even a primitive form of language between separate populations. The most famous and distinct orangutan sound is the long call made by dominant males, which can last between 15 seconds and 4 minutes and can be heard from over a kilometer away through the dense jungle. Here's an example. <coughs> Sounds like Grandpa trying to get off the couch. The long call is produced several times per day and can work as a spontaneous outburst of hey everyone just reminding you who's in charge or as a direct response to a challenging male entering his territory. And of course the long call also acts as a way to notify nearby females when he's ready to orangabang. Sorry about that. The dominant male will impregnate multiple females within his range, and that's about the extent of his parental endeavors, playing no direct role in raising the baby. Mommy orangutans, on the other hand, are some of the most devoted parents in the animal kingdom. They're the slowest breeding mammals on Earth, with females reaching sexual maturity between age 10 and 15, then giving birth only once every 6 to 8 years after that. Orangutan pregnancies last about 8.5 months, and the baby orangutans are born weighing on average 3.5 pounds. For the first two years of its life, a baby orangutan is completely dependent on its mother for food and transportation. Even at up to five years old, young orangutans will still be clinging to their mother when she moves through the branches. And even when he or she becomes too large to carry, the offspring will stay at their mother's side until they're about 10 years old. At which point they go off on their own, or in the company of other newly independent orangutans. It's thought that these prolonged childhoods exist primarily because there's so much that the offspring needs to learn before they can successfully live on their own. Such as where to find food, what to eat, how to eat it, as this sometimes involves using tools, and how to build a sleeping nest without falling out of a tree in the middle of the night. Mother orangutans also need to protect their young from predators, although they have very few. But one thing they can't protect their babies from is human activity. Although poaching does play a role in orangutan population decline, the greatest contributor by far is habitat loss due to deforestation. And the perpetrator behind this massive land exploitation is the palm oil industry. The oil palm, Elaeus guineensis, has been farmed and harvested for use as a staple food crop for roughly 5,000 years. Early civilizations discovered that an oil could be extracted from the fruit of this palm and was very versatile in its uses, primarily as a cooking oil. It originated in West Africa, 
where it was one of the earliest traded commodities and had very high societal value in ancient cultures. Then, as a result of the British Industrial Revolution and the expansion of overseas trade, the use of palm oil in the international market began to expand. Fast forward to now, it's still heavily used as a cooking oil in Africa and Asia, as well as a preservative, filler, or lubricant in roughly half of the packaged products that you'll find on supermarket shelves. It's also used in most hair and skincare products and even biofuel. Since 1990, palm oil consumption has quintupled, making it the most commonly used vegetable oil worldwide. Indonesia and Malaysia are the two largest cultivators and exporters of palm oil, producing a combined yield of over 51 million metric tons in 2016 alone. So what exactly is all of this palm oil being used for? The reason for its industry popularity is that compared to other vegetable oils, palm oil is inexpensive, easy to extract, has a higher yield, spoils more slowly, and has very little odor or flavor. But as always, convenience comes at a cost. In order to keep up with the high demand for palm oil, a large amount of land is needed for mass cultivation and the warm, humid climate of Southeast Asia provides ideal growing conditions. One problem, large and biodiverse rainforests get in the way of potential farming territory, so those have to be removed in order to make space. Over 20 million hectares of land are already covered in palm oil plantations. To make way for these plantations, the forests are often destroyed via a technique known as slash and burn. Slash and burn agriculture is a terrifyingly common practice that entails cutting down large sections of forest right before the dry season begins, and then setting fire to the vegetation after it's dried out. These controlled burns leave behind nothing but ash, which then fertilizes the soil and expedites the planting process. The slash and burn technique has been used worldwide in small-scale farming operations for thousands of years, but in large-scale operations, the ecological implications are horrific to say the least. The smoke from slash and burn deforestation is a devastating air pollutant and health risk for local communities, and larger burns can even be seen from space. Even when the slash and burn method isn't being used, all forms of rainforest clear cutting release billions of tons of stored carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, further expediting the effects of climate change. Down on the ground, things aren't much better. Local wildlife, orangutans included, either die in the deforestation process or are killed off by plantation workers who view them as pests. The island of Borneo alone lost more than half of its orangutan population between 1999 and 2015. And orangutans aren't the only species affected. The sun bear, Borneo elephant, Sumatran elephant, Sumatran rhino, and Sumatran tiger also rely on these rainforests for their continued survival. All in all, the situation is pretty terrible, but it's not hopeless. There are three simple steps that you can take that will make a huge difference. Step one is to know what you're buying. The food industry can be somewhat sketchy about how they label their ingredients. And a prime example of this is the fact that there are over 300 different names for palm oil and its derivatives. Some of the more common ones are Elias guineensis oil, which is most common in cosmetics, vegetable oil, vegetable fat, glycerin, palm kernel oil, PKO, PHPKO, OPKO, sodium kernelate, palmitic acid, octyl palmitate, palmitile alcohol, and basically any ingredient with the word palm in it. So if you see an ingredient that you don't recognize on the back of your shampoo bottle, type it into Google and find out exactly what it is that you're buying. Once you've identified your palm oil, move on to step two. Use less, because you really don't need that much. Palm oil isn't one of those products like pangolin scales or rhino horn that has no legitimate use for humans. It's an incredibly versatile and useful ingredient in many products. However, it's rarely 100% necessary. All you need to do is check if there's a palm oil free alternative to the product that you're buying. And if there isn't one, it's time to move on to step three, support sustainably sourced palm oil. The best way to do this is by purchasing products that are RSPO certified. RSPO, or the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, is an organization that, quote, unites stakeholders from the seven sectors of the palm oil industry, oil palm producers, processors or traders, consumer goods manufacturers, retailers, banks, investors, and environmental and social non-government organizations to develop and implement global standards for sustainable palm oil. The RSPO has developed a set of environmental and social criteria which companies must comply with in order to produce certified sustainable palm oil, or CSPO. Aside from swearing off palm oil entirely, purchasing only RSPO certified products is the most eco-friendly option. So in conclusion, completely eliminating palm oil from our lives probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. But if we significantly decrease our consumption and only support sustainably sourced palm oil products, we will eventually completely eliminate the need to take away any more precious habitat from our beautiful cousins, the orangutans. Thanks for watching. 
New episodes of Conserving Hope the first Monday of every month only on Miller's Wildlife. I'll see you next time.